This video will look at a data summary and how to display and analyze sample data. So we are going to be using samples today. And as a reminder, when we're describing samples, we use statistics. Those statistics are X bar if I'm dealing with an average, an S if I'm dealing with a standard deviation, and a P hat if I'm dealing with a sample. So let's start by looking at the visual ways of representing data before we calculate these numbers, but this is coming up down the road. So suppose that I ask 10 people at a local Starbucks how many strawberry and cream lattes they plan on having, and I get the following numbers. If I want to display the data, it would be a really bad idea to start at the lowest value, say 25, and then count by one until I get all the way to the highest value, because the highest value in this case is 67. So if I was counting by ones, I would have a block at 25, a whole bunch of dead space, a block at 28, and there'd just be a whole lot of kind of empty space, and it wouldn't really summarize my data or give me a feel where the numbers actually are. So I'm seeing an issue, and let's fix the issue. The issue here is I need to combine categories. So instead of starting with um, 25 and counting by one, let's kind of go in a different direction and figure out how many of these blocks am I really willing to have. 42, unreasonable. Five, probably much more reasonable. So here's my idea. We're going to use bins with multiple values for our categories. We're going to figure out the range. The range is defined as the largest value minus the smallest value. So in this case, our range will be 67. Take away our smallest value in the set is 25. When I do the subtraction, I get 42. Next thing I'm going to do is determine the size of the bins. So whatever my range is, I'm going to divide this by the desired number of blocks. When I do this, always round up a little. We'll see why this is important when we're making the bins down below, but ultimately we want to shoot past that last value. And if we don't round up, we will stop just before getting that last number. So I'm taking the max minus the min, that's 42 in this case, the range. And let's say I want one, two, three, four, five blocks in my graph. When I do this division, I end up getting 8.4, but I'm going to use instead a bin of 8.5, just a little bit bigger of whatever I get. I'm now going to make the categories for where these blocks are going to be. So ultimately, I'm going to start at this 25, and I'm going to count up by 8.5s. So, and I'm being careful with my inequalities. So this is what's going on in this thing. I am going to include the lower value, and I'm not going to include the upper value for each of these inequalities. So you start at the min, and then you're going to count by the bin size. So I start at the smallest value, 25. This first category is going to include the number of 25, and that's going to go up to, but not including, 33.5. I added 8.5 to 25 there. The next category is going to start at 33.5, and it's going to include it. These are kind of like Legos. There's an open part and there's a closed part, and they link together. So 33.5, adding 8.5 to this puts me at 42. This does not include 42. 42 starts at the next category. I'm going up by 8.5, so this would go to 50.5. The next one would start at 50.5, and 
and include it. I'm adding 8.5 is going up to 59. Last one starts at 59. And this goes all the way up to 67.5, not including 67.5. So this is why it was important that I round up a little bit, because otherwise I'd end right at 67, and I would not be including that last value of 67. I want to make sure I shoot past it. So now instead of counting by ones, I've combined all of these blocks together. Let's figure out how often values actually show up. And let's also include units for these numbers. This is number of strawberry cream lattes. This is the number of people in each of these categories. And I like to just kind of cross out the data as I'm going through it and doing my count. I'm looking for numbers between 25, including 25, up to 33.5, not including 33.5. So I've got 25, I've got 31, I've got 31, I have 28. And it looks like that's it. So for my first frequency, I have four there. Now some of these might be blank. It's okay to have blank spots. That shows me where there's sort of a lack in my data set. That's part of the shape. I just don't want 40 blank spots. So 33.5 up to 42, include 33.5, do not include 42, okay. 43, nope, too big. Shoot, doesn't look like there's any for that one. So I do have a spot in this graph where I have a frequency of zero. And again, totally okay. Starting at 42, going up to 50.5, I see I have 43, I have 44, I have 47. Looks like I have three values in that category. 50.5 to 59, looks like I have the number 56, so just the one. 59, including 59 if this was part of my data set, up to but not including 67.5. I see one, two numbers that belong there. I see two numbers that belong there. Quick way to double check, they told us that there were nine, uh, 10 numbers to start out with. Let's add these things up. Four, seven, eight, 10. Adds up like it should. I'm in good shape. So let's graph it. When I'm creating these graphs, a couple of features that I should include. I need to make sure that I have titles for all of my graphs, and I need to make sure that I have units where appropriate. So for my y-axis, I'm going to have my frequencies. So these are my counts. I'm just going to label it as FREQ frequency. And I have one, two, three, four. These are just the counts I have on the side. And for my x-axis, this starts at 25. And I'm counting by 8.5. So these will be the blocks, 25 to 33.5, 33.5 to 42. 42 to 50.5, 50.5 to 59, and 59 to 67.5. This axis is the number of strawberry cream lattes. You'll notice that I'm counting consistently by 8.5 here. To show that there's a jump from 0 to 25, it's customary to put this little lightning bolt symbol at the start of the graph. It's like you took that axis and you kind of squished it in. This just says I'm skipping values. Now I'm going to make blocks with their corresponding heights. So from 25 to 33.5, there were four people inside of this category. I'm writing the numbers above. You don't have to write the numbers above. 33.5 to 42, there were zero values in that. 42 to 50.5, I have three there. 
And final category, I have two. So I see some sort of initial mount, it drops down and then it comes back up again. So I can get a feel for the shape of the data and I can see when there are certain gaps or mounds or outliers or whatever the case may be for the graph. So I have my units, frequencies, number of strawberry cream lattes. I'd also want a title. Ideally, your graph should stand on its own. At a bare minimum, you should have some sort of title so that people know what this is about. This is number of strawberry cream lattes in a season. Okay, I'm gonna create another graph using the same information. And this one's gonna be called a relative histogram. I'm still gonna have blocks at touch. That's a defining characteristic of a histogram. But whenever I see the word relative, I'm gonna have percentages. So instead of saying there were three people between 42 and 50.5, I'm gonna rewrite this as a percentage. So maybe something like 30% of people were between 42 and 50.5 strawberry cream lattes. So when I make my table, this table was called a frequency table. I'm going to now be making a relative frequency table. And I make this table just by adding an extra column with my sample success rates, my percentages. I'm gonna have the same categories though, 25, to 33.5. I'm always using these inequalities. If you just write down stuff like 25 to 33.5 with words or with little dashes instead of inequalities, I don't know if you're including the left value or the right value or what the deal is. These inequalities really tell us for sure we're including the left number, we're not including the right number. So next one's from 42 to 50.5, next one is 50.5 to 59, last one starts at 59 and it goes up to 67.5. Counts, well it's the same counts, it's the same graph. I'm changing very little. I'm adding a column for percentages. To figure out these percentages, I'm going to take the number of values in any one of these categories, and I'm going to divide it by the total number of terms. So for example, 4 out of a total of 10 gives me 0.4 or 40%. Next category, 0 out of 10, that's 0%. 3 out of 10. That's 0.3 or 30%. I have one out of 10, that's 10%. 40, 70, 80, I'm at 80% so far. So this last category must be 20% because if you add these things up correctly, they should add close to 100% or so. So I'm gonna make a graph and it's gonna look really similar to the graph that I just made. I'm counting by the same thing here for my x-axis when I'm looking at number of strawberry cream lattes, but I'm changing this y-axis and now I'll have percentages here. If you're looking for a prettier graph, you can use a straight, ed straight edge or I'll show you how to do these same things using technology. But I find that it's nice to know how to do it by hand. So that way, when you're looking at the graph using technology, you can be a little bit more critical about it. Sometimes when you make a graph in Excel, it just spits out something that's gibberish. And unless you know what you're looking for, you'll end up submitting weird graphs to people that don't actually summarize the information. Okay, first block, 25 to 33.5. Percentage-wise, that's a 40. Next category, zero. Then I have 
Next spin, I have 10%. Last spin, I have 20%. And as always, I need to make sure I have a title. I'll take any sort of title as far as grading is concerned, if that's something that you're concerned about. So you can even just call this number of strawberry cream lattes 2020, or whatever the year happens to be that you're watching for the number of strawberry cream lattes, pretty low stress. Um, this is nice because I can see a summary of the data. 40% of people had between 25 and 33.5 strawberry cream lattes. That's equivalent of four people from my sample. And I don't have this weird thing where I just have like a whole bunch of empty spaces. It really clumps things together in a nice way for me. The downside is I've lost some information when I'm looking at this graph. Just looking at this graph, if I asked you, well, how many people had 31 strawberry cream lattes? I can no longer see that from here. I would have to go back to my data to see that there were exactly two people that had 31. So I have summarized it, but in doing so, I've lost information. That's sort of the double-edged sword of graphs, is they combine everything in one spot, but you lose a little bit by doing so. So let's look at another graph that actually keeps that piece of information for you. This is called a stem and leaf plot. So unlike a histogram, I'm not gonna be losing that 31 data where I can see the number of people that had 31 strawberry cream lattes. The graph might not look as nice as a histogram. So here's my idea. I'm gonna create a column for the tens place. and another column for the ones place. So stem and leaf, these are some sort of a table graphical thing, and it's broken down over any two decimal places. So for example, this could be tens and ones, this could be split up as hundreds, and your tens spot, it could be split up as your ones and your decimals, any sort of break in your natural data set. Next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna put all of your tens values or whatever this column is down. So looking at my information, my smallest 10 is a 20, my largest 10 is a 60. So I have things in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Now just as a note, some of these things might be blank. So it's possible that I don't have anything in the 30s. That would be okay. I still have this spot over here to show that there's a gap in my data set. So I have my table. I put the tens in the tens place. I'm gonna put the ones that are linked with those tens in the ones place. And when I do this, I'm gonna arrange them from smallest on the inside all the way to largest on the outside. So for example, 25, that has a one spot of five. I have another number that's in its 20s, 28. I'm gonna put a comma, I have more than one number in the 20s. The next is 28. So I can see the number still, there's 25, there's 28. I'm gonna do the same thing for the 30s now. Looks like I have 31, 30, one and 31. Shows up twice, so I'm writing it down twice. And I'm lining up my values as I go because this is gonna give me some sort of a shape when I'm done. Forties. In order, it looks like I have 43. 43. Looks like I have 44. And it looks like I have 47. For the 50s, I only have one number. I have 56. 60s, I have 64, and I have 67. Here's the nice thing about this graph. If I asked you how many 31s are there, I can see there are two 31s. Also, if you tilt the paper to the side, you still have a rough idea of what the shape of the data looks like. So I've kept all of the information 
and I've kept this, the shape of it. The downside is not a ton of people have seen the stem and leaf compared to the histogram. This is a bit more of an obscure graph. So I might have more of the things preserved, but less people might be able to read it. So as a result of this, I have to make sure that I include a title, as always, number of strawberry cream lattes in a season. And I should also think about including a key. So in this case, my key might look something like the following. If I saw a four on one side and a three on the other, this is the number 43 strawberry cream lattes. If I saw a six line seven, that's 67 strawberry cream lattes. So we've seen three graphs, kind of two and a half for looking at this quantitative data. I have histograms and relative histograms. This is what I mean by half. This is pretty much the same thing as this. And we also have stem and leaf graphs. This next type of graph is going to be looking at categorical or qualitative data. So this is my word-based data. And I call it a bar plot. Bar plots are like histograms for word-based data. And let's look at an example of it. Create a bar plot for the distribution of candies if there are 10 grape, eight lime, and two strawberry. So on my x-axis, I'm going to have my categories, in this case, flavors. So I have grape, lime, and strawberry. And my axis there is flavor. On my y-axis, I'll have my count. Smallest number is two, largest is 10, so I'll count by twos. And I'll make blocks for each of the categories. Now, unlike histograms where the blocks touch, bar plots have separate graphs. So here's my grape, it's 10. Here's my lime, that's eight. Here's my strawberry, that's two. The reason why I don't have these things touching is because there's no overlap in the categories. I don't have a candy that I start to eat that starts break and turns into a strawberry candy. If that was the case, that would have to be its own category. So to show that these are unique flavors, the bars don't touch. So this is an example of a bar plot or bar graph. Let's also create a relative bar plot. And I want you to pause the video and look back through your notes and try to remember what did that word relative mean? Because I want to do something like a relative histogram with this data set when I'm looking at a relative bar plot. So what does relative mean? And then try to make the graph if you can. What do you think this is going to look like? Pause and give it a go. So for that word relative, I hope you're remembering that this meant percent. So let's make just a little table before we try to graph this. I've got my flavors of grape, lime, and strawberry. Grape showed up 10 times. Lime showed up eight times. Strawberry showed up twice. And I just want to make sure that I get percentages before I try to graph this. So it looks like if I add together all of my counts, this is out of 20 candies. So for percentages, I'm going to be taking the number 10 divided by the total number values 20. This gives me 0.5 or 50%.
I'm going to do 8 divided by 20 for this next one to get 40%. I'm going to do 2 divided by 20 to get a final percentage of 10. Quick check, adding these up, 50, 90, 100%. They should add up pretty dang close to 100%. Okay, making my graph. I still have grape, lime, and strawberry on the bottom. Instead of having counts here, I'm going to have my percentages. I'm going to count by 10%. Grape showed up 50% of the time. Lime shows up 40% of the time. And strawberry shows up 10% of the time. Reminder, all good graphs have labels and they should also have titles. So even if it's just a placeholder, so you'll remember to do so later, make sure you include a space there so you have titles for your graphs. All right, I have some graphs here looking at different data sets, but I wanna be able to describe these things. So when I'm looking at, for example, the stem and leaf plot on the side, it kind of like, looks like it has two mounds. It looks like it's coming off more to the right side than it is to the left side, but I wanna be able to formalize that language. So when describing graphs, there are three features to kind of look at. And I'm going to draw just a rough sketch of what I'm talking about. So I might have a data set that looks something like this when I graph it, where it has two mounds, has a long tail coming out to the right, and there's one value that just kind of pops up from nowhere. So I want to be able to describe the number of mounds, I want to be able to describe which tail is longer, and I want to look out to see if there are any outliers. I call a graph unimodal if it has one mount. So one mound graph, that's an example of one mound. This would be an example of one mound too. Notice there are a lot of blocks to it, but if you were to kind of put a sheet over that thing, it would look like it was just one mountain range. Bimodal, bi means two, so this is a two-mounted graph. So maybe you have something like that is bimodal. If I'm doing it with blocks, that's also bimodal. If there are multiple mounds, so two plus mounds, we say it's multimodal. So by extension, anything that is bimodal is multimodal, but not everything that's multimodal is bimodal. So this is two or more, this is strictly two. If you have a graph that has a long tail coming off to the left side, like this, or like this if it's blocky, I call that left skewed. So left skewed, this is a long left tail. By extension, right skewed is a long right tail. So it comes off more to the right side than it does to the left side. Tapers off towards the right. If both the left tail and the right tail are about the same size, I call it symmetric. So this is when the tails are the same size. Symmetric means that you could put a mirror down the center and the thing would reflect upon itself. Uniform, this means if you graph it, it has the same height throughout. So uniform is the same height for the entire graph. So 
So number of mounds, something about the tails. Last thing we're looking for is there could be some value way out here all by itself. We call any value that's well outside of your data set an outlier. This is an informal definition for outlier. We'll come up with the numeric one later. For now, we're just saying something that's a really, really long ways away from the rest of your data. I'm gonna draw two graphs here, and we're just gonna practice using this vocab on describing these two graphs. So for this one, And another one. Okay. I want you to try to pause the video and look at both of these and see if you can figure out what's going on with the mounds. What's going on with the tails? And is there an outlier in the graph? Assuming you pause the video and try that out, let's do this together here. Looking at this, it appears that there are two mounds. I don't typically count an outlier as a mound, so there are two mounds. So for the shape, I would say this is bimodal. The tails, each one of these mounds has a tail coming out to the right, so each of the mounds is right skewed. The graph in its totality also has a long right tail. It's a right skewed graph. I've got a value way out here on its own, so there is an outlier. This next graph, if I put a sheet on top of this thing, it looks like it has just one big mound, even though it rises a little bit there. That's nothing compared to the overall shape. So this would be a unimodal graph. This has a longer tail coming off to the left side. So I'd call this left skewed. And looking at this point, it's a little bit away, but it's not super far away like this value. This is still reasonably close to the mound of my data set. In fact, I think this is just as close to the middle as this is. So if I'm calling this an outlier, I would have to call that an outlier. And I certainly don't think that is. That's still a part of my data set. So I would say there are no outliers. Typically, when I'm describing graphs, I don't declare that there's a lack of something. So I would just say that this is unimodal and left skewed. Uh, saying that there are no outliers is saying there's nothing unusual going on. And if you declare that there's nothing unusual going on, that starts to seem a little bit suspicious. Like if my partner asked me how work was today and I said, well, there wasn't a fire then she thinks that there's usually a fire at work and that would be a problematic thing for her to believe. So usually only declare if there is actually an outlier. If there's not, you don't have to report the lack of something. This is a verbal way of kind of going through and describing graphs. We've had a visual way of looking at the graphs themselves. I want to add a third piece to the puzzle describing the things numerically. So we're going to have three different ways to talk about the center, and we're going to have two different ways of describing the spread. So when I'm looking at center, I have the mean, median, and mode are all ways of describing where the center of a data set is. You may have heard these terms before. Another way to describe mean is this is my average. And a reminder, we are working with sample data here today. And my symbol for a sample average is x bar. 
and the average to find this, I add all of my values and you divide this by the number of terms. Median, this is the middle number after you put them in order. If there are two middle numbers, then average them. And I'll, as always, I'm going to give you these definitions and I'm going to show you exactly what I mean by them. Finally, mode, this is the most frequent if it exists. And the mode can be defined differently from author to author. I kind of subscribe to the Highlander definition of the mode. There can be only one. So if there's one value that exists more than any other value, I would describe that as the mode. If they all show up the same number of times, I would say there's no mode. Calculate the mean, median, and mode for the data set 86753090. Let's see what we got going on. I'm going to start by finding the average. The average adds the values up, 8 plus 6 plus 7 plus dot, 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 I'm adding them up, divided by the number of terms. I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 numbers in the list. Now, as I type this into my calculator, I'm just thinking to myself, my smallest number is 0, my largest number is 9. I'm really hoping I get a number that's between 0 and 9 here. And when I do this, I get 4.22 repeating. That seems like a reasonable measure of sound. Next thing, we're going to find the median. Before I can find the median, I need to make sure that I have my numbers in order. Uh, and I'm going to put them in order from smallest to largest. So I have 0, 0, 0. I have a 3, a 5. A six, seven, an eight, and a nine. I have nine numbers, so splitting nine and a half, I have one, two, three, four on both sides, and one number in the middle. My median here is five. My numbers are between zero and nine. This is literally the middle number. This also seems reasonable as a measure of center. So these both seem to do a pretty good job of measuring the center. Let's look to see if there's a number that shows up more than any others. I'm looking at this and I seem to get zero. This seems like an awful way to measure center. Typically, I'm going to avoid using the mode as a measure of center. In fact, the only time when I think that's useful is when I'm dealing with categories. Because if you ask me what's the mode for the flavors, I would say grape is the mode. It shows up more than any other flavor. So it's really not awesome when you're dealing with quantitative information. The mode only really shines when you're dealing with qualitative information. Another example, this one with the same set of numbers, 8675309, Zero. Last numbers change to a negative 100, though. So you might call that thing an outlier. Let's see what happens to our average when we have the same data set, but this last number is now a negative 100. So my numbers now go from negative 100 up to 9, although most of my numbers are still between 0 and 9. I get an average of negative 6.88 repeating. It's actually exactly that, not even approximate, so I can have an equal sign there. My average went from 4.222 to negative 6.888.
this negative 100 pulled that average down considerably. So when I'm talking about the mean as an average, this is a weighted number. It feels the weight of every single value. Medium. Putting these things in order from smallest to largest, I have negative 100, I have 0, 0, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. In fact, it's the same list that I just had, I'm just changing that last number. So as a result of that, my middle number, it's still in the same spot right here at 5, my median has not changed. Finally, the mode, the number that shows up the most here, still zero. Still not a great measure of sound. So something interesting that I noticed is that the median stayed the same when I changed or had an outlier, but my average changed considerably. So the technical way to say this is the median is resistant to outliers. If there is an outlier, think about using the median as the center. The mean feels the weight of every single value, so is not resistant to outliers. As a result of this, the mean is often on the longest tail. It feels the weight of those extreme values that are way outside on the longest tail. The median always splits the area in half. So I'm going to show you a couple of doodles here where I'm looking at some graphs. And I'm just going to show you where I have the median and the mean on those graphs. I'm just doing this on a piece of scratch paper. You can do this on the back of the page of your notes if you have a back of the page. I'm just going to put it to the side here. And I'm going to visualize the mean and the median. So let's say I have a graph like this. My median is cutting the area in the half. That doesn't mean that I split the x values in half. It means if you think of this like being made out of clay, I want to find the spot that where when I cut it, I have the same amount of clay on the left side that I do on the right side. So moving along, I would think that it's somewhere about here. If I cut here and think about the amount of white space that I have on this side and the total size of the blocks, and the total size of the blocks on this side put together, this is about halfway in the area. That's my median. So the median is half the area. It splits that area in half. In contrast, the mean feels the weight of values. It's a weighted average. You can think of this as meaning that the mean feels gravity. So if I were to drop a ball right here and gravity existed, would it roll up the hill or down the hill? Well, obviously, if I dropped this and this was smooth, the ball would probably roll down a little bit. 
So what I would anticipate having an average X bar somewhere a little bit less than the median. Let's look at another graph. Cutting the area in half, if I have these three blocks, these three blocks are like the size of this one block. So my median is probably somewhere about here, cutting the area in half. If I drop a ball here, it would roll down the hill a little bit. So what I would anticipate having an average, probably somewhere there, a little bit down the hill. Let's look at a third one. Cutting the area in half on this one, pretty dang easy. That's just right here. This is my medium. If I were to drop a ball, it wouldn't roll left or right. It would kind of balance on the top of that stack. So this also looks like it would be my main. Now, if you're looking at these graphs and you're thinking about skewness, this has a long left tail. This has a long right tail. And this thing has a mirror image to it. So let's write down the skewness to each and see what we notice about the median and the mean in those situations. This has a long left tail, so this is left skewed. And in the situation where it's left skewed, my average is smaller than my median. This is actually a mathematical definition for left skewedness. If your average is less than your median, your data is left skewed. Let's look at this one. Your average is bigger than your median and it has a long right tail. So we say something is right skewed if your average is bigger than your median. Finally, this is symmetric and the two values are about the same. So I will say something is symmetric if your average is approximately the same as your median. I'm gonna go back to examples three and four that we just looked at earlier, and I'm gonna compare the mean and the median to see if I can determine skewness of the graph. For example, in example three, my average X bar was smaller than my median. If my average is smaller than my median, this tells me if I were to graph this thing, this is going to be left skewed. So the interesting thing, at least I think this is an interesting thing, is I'm already able to kind of visualize if I'm gonna have a long left tail or a long right tail based only off of the centers. So the centers themselves can even start to tell me a little bit about the spread. Now, if I wanted to know exactly how big each of the tails are and how extreme those differences look like, we're gonna to have to have some better tools to do that. So let's consider now measures of spread. So when should we use median and when should we use mean as our measures of center? Use the median as the center if there is heavy skewness or an outlier because the median is resistant to an outlier. The median is position-based. If there is no outlier, I'm going to use the mean as the center. If there is no outlier or no extreme skewness. And instead of being position-based, the mean is value-based or weight-based. 
So I kind of have this bifurcation, these two different ways of looking at things. I'll have a whole bunch of things that will be all position-based, and I'll have a whole bunch of things that are value-based. So when I'm describing spread, I'm gonna have something called the five number summary. This will be a position-based way of looking at spread. I'm also going to calculate something called a standard deviation. When I'm doing the standard deviation later on, this is going to be value-based spread. So let's get our hands dirty and look at these two different types of spread. First one. I'm gonna split my data up so I can have a positional way of looking at things. So here is an example of just some numbers that I have in the line. And I want to split these things up as much as I can into nice little chunks. So one thing I can do is I can determine what the smallest and largest value will be for my data set. That's kind of what my range does. So my range always already gives me some way of looking at the total spread of the data set. If I'm thinking about the position, the median tells me the halfway mark. So at least I can figure out where my upper half and my lower half are. If I want to break this up even more, I could break my data into quarters. So I'll have my lowest 25%, my next lowest 25%, my next 25%, and my highest 25%. So from here to here, that's my first quarter, my first quartile. I'm 50% in, I'm three quarters of the way in, or that's my third quarter mark, and that's my maximum. So my five number summary, these are the boundaries that help me determine where all of the quarters are for my data set. Five number summary has the minimum, the maximum, it has the median as the middle number, and it has the first quarter mark, the first quartile, and it has this third quarter mark, my third quartile. To find the first quartile, this is the median or the middle of the lower half. In contrast, the third quarter, looking at this, this is in the middle of your upper half. A note on halves, do not include the middle number if it's part of your data set when calculating or determining your upper and your lower half. Let me show you what I mean by that. So here I have this data set 86753900, and I'm gonna find the five number data, the five number summary set for this data. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put all these numbers in order. So I have three zeros, a three, five, six, seven, eight, and a nine. I'm going to peel off the two easiest ones I can find from the start, the minimum and the maximum. I still want my first quarter, my median, and my third quarter. I'll find those as I'm going along. But my smallest number is clearly zero. 
and my largest number is nine. So all of my numbers are between zero and nine. Cutting this thing in half, so I have nine numbers, so pair, another pair, another pair, another pair, another pair. My middle number is five. So my median is five. I wanna make sure I have the same number of values in the lower half that I do in the upper half. So if I have one, two, three, four numbers here in the lower part, and one, two, three, four, four numbers here in the upper part, I've split the data up evenly. So I'm excluding this value of five because otherwise I wouldn't have the same number of values in the lower and upper part. And I'm trying to break this up as evenly as possible. So in this case, when I'm finding Q1, that's gonna be the middle of this set. That's between the numbers zero and zero. My Q1 is zero. Upper half, I have four numbers. My middle number in this data set is between the seven and the eight. My Q3 is halfway between, it's 7.5. So I have 25% of my data from zero to zero, 25% from zero to five, another 25% from five to 7.5, and a final 25% from 7.5 to 9. I have broken my data up into quarter pieces. I can see where the spread is. So if you ask me where is the middle 50%, I would say the middle 50% happens between 0 and 7.5. And Let's look at another example. 4, 4, 6, 8, uh, 10, and 20. And I want the five number summary. So I'm going to want the minimum, Q1, the median, Q3, and the maximum. These are already in order for me. I have 4, 4, 6, 8, 10, 20. I can see that the smallest number is 4, and the largest number is 20. So finding the middle value that happens between six and eight, my median is seven. This broke up nice and smoothly into three values in the lower and three values in the upper. So I can just immediately find the middles of each of these things to get Q1 and Q3. The middle number in this set is four, so Q1 is four. The middle number in this set is 10, so Q3 is 10. I have broken the data up into quarters by locating the minimum, Q1, the median, Q3, and the maximum. If I wanted to visualize these quarters, I can almost see it here, but not quite. Let's put this on a number line, and this becomes something called a box plot. So here's the idea for a box plot. I start with a number line. And I count consistently all the way from my smallest number to my largest number. So maybe in this case, I'm counting by twos or so. The box plot is a graph. So if I have units, I would make sure that I include units. And if this was actually describing something that was important, I would want to type. Now that I have my number line, I'm gonna mark my five number summary and I'm gonna use vertical lines to do it. So I have the minimum here at four. I have Q1 also here at four. I have the median at seven. I have Q3 at 10. And I have the maximum up here at 20. The box part of a box plot is found by connecting Q1 and Q3. So connect Q1 and Q3 to form the middle 50%. Next part is the whiskers from the lowest value to the highest value, extend a line to represent 
the lowest 25% and the highest 25%. Nice thing about box plots is this is showing you where the quarters is, and it also shows you the skewness. Notice how this has a really, really long right tail. And technically, these values match up entirely, so I'm drawing a little line, but in actuality, they're like smack dab against each other. So it has a long right tail and almost no left tail. I would call this thing right skewed. This is another way that I can use to display data. So let's try to make a box plot for the strawberry cream latte data. This is a two-step process. I need to find my five number summary. And then I'll need to graph that five number summary on a number line. I'm gonna put these numbers in order, 25, 28, 31, 31, 43, 44, 47, 56, 64, and 67. Smallest number is 25, largest number is 67. On the number line, 25, maybe I count by tens here. This is number of strawberry cream lattes. I have to make sure that I think of a fun title for the graph. I'll find the middle number. Looks like the middle number is somewhere between 43 and 44. I had 10 values, so this splits this into a lower half of five and an upper half of five. Halfway between 43 and 44 is my median of 43.5. Middle half, if I'm looking for the middle value, that's right there at 31. Q1 is 31. Units for all of these things are number of strawberry cream lattes. I should include those. Upper half, I have five numbers and the middle number is right here. My Q3 is 56. I'm gonna graph the five number summary, 25, 31, 43.5, 56, and 67. I connect Q1 and Q3 to form my middle box. I extend my whiskers to the smallest and largest value to get my box and whisker graph. Again, what's going on here is I've broken my data up into quarters. So I have 25% of my data in each one of these four pieces. I have a very clear positional way of seeing where everything lives. We have one last way of looking at spread here. Standard deviation. So when I was looking at the five number summary, this was position based and it included the median because the median's position based. When I'm looking at value based, this is when I use my average X bar. And I'm gonna see that show up when I'm doing these calculations on this page. So here's the idea of what it is, and here's how I find this. So the standard deviation and this is standard deviation for a sample, so it's S, is roughly the average gap size from the center. So let me show you an example. Let's suppose you have the data set of two, five, and eight. And I wanna find the standard deviation. My average number in this case is five. 
So I'm wondering how far are each of these numbers away from five? Well, this has a gap of three. Two is three units away from five. And this also has a gap size of three. Eight is three away from five. So my average gap size, just doing the subtraction there, is three. So my standard deviation for the set 258 will be the value three. Let's try to come up with a formula for looking at this thing. And just a note, I might get it wrong as I'm calculating this. I'll fix things if I make a mistake. So S, I'm using my erasable pen here because I'm pretty sure I'm going to make a mistake. But again, totally OK if I do so. I want to have the gaps on the top and the number of gaps on the bottom. So I'm going to add the 3. And I found the 3 by taking my value and subtracting the center from it. So I had 5 minus 2, I had 8 minus 5, I had my values minus their center. And I added all of these things up. So for my formula on the side here, my first value in my list is 2. The center in my list is 5. So I have 2 minus 5. I'm going to try to include all the values just to see what happens. Next value in my list is 5. But it's my center, so 5 minus 5 is 0, so I really don't care about that. Last value in the list is 8. The center is 5. 8 minus 5 gives me a gap of 3 there. So I had each of these values minus centers. That's where I got these 3s from. And the standard deviation is the average of them. So I'm adding all of these gaps up. And I'm dividing it by the number of gaps. And if I had three values, I had two gaps. It's the spaces between numbers. So you can think of it as the number of commas. If I had two numbers, there's one gap in between. If I had four values, I would have three spaces in between. The number of gaps is always the number of values minus one. So in our case, we had three minus one. We had two values there on the bottom. I would like you to pause the video and type in this S. I'm curious what you'll get when you try to find the standard deviation. I typed this into my calculator, and I feel like I might have done something wrong, because when I did this, I got 0. So let's try to figure out where that 0 could be coming from, because clearly I see a gap of 3 up here. So I'm a little bit concerned that all of a sudden this is saying I have no spread. Clearly there is spread. So I have 2 minus 5 gives me negative 3, OK? 5 minus 5 is 0. 8 minus 5 is 3. And when I combine these, oh, shoot. Negative 3 and the positive 3 are canceling out. I didn't have negatives and positives up here. I just counted them all as gap sizes of 3. So in order to avoid this negative and this positive canceling each other out, let's try squaring each of these gap sizes first. So I had an issue with the signs. We're going to try this again. And I'm going to square to avoid, I hope, getting 0. So I want you to type that into your calculator, pause the video, give it a go. I'm really, really hoping that we don't get 0 this time, because there's clearly spread. OK, assuming you pause the video, I typed this into my calculator just a second ago to see what I got. And I got 9. And while I'm really happy that this is no longer 0, I'm a little bit bothered that I'm not getting the value 3. But when I think about this, I don't have my s anymore. I actually have my s squared. This thing has a name, and it's called the variance. 
So when I do this long calculation here, and I'll write down a formula for this in just a second. I just wanted you to see where it came from before just giving you a formula. My variance is nine. So to get rid of this square, I'm gonna have to take the square root of the variance to get my standard deviation. So taking the square root of the number nine puts me back at three. Three is my average gap size, that's a reasonable value to get. So let me give you a formula for the standard deviation on this next one, and then let's see what we get. The variance is the value, first value, minus the average squared. You add all these things up. So next value minus the average squared plus dot, dot, dot. And you divide this by the total number of values minus one. These represents your gaps. This represents the number of gaps. To get your standard deviation, you're going to take the square root of the variance. So for this set, five, seven, seven, ten, 10, the first thing I need to do is find the average. I'm gonna find the average by adding these four numbers together and dividing it by four. So I have five plus seven plus seven plus 10. I divide this by four. I have an average of 7.25. I'm gonna find the variance next. The variance is my S squared number. And I get this by taking the first value in my list. Well, the first value in my list is five and I subtract the center, 7.25. To avoid everything canceling out, I'm gonna square this to deal with any negative issues. I'm gonna add the next value in the list, seven minus 7.25, I'm gonna square it. I'm gonna add the next value in my list, seven minus 7.25, I'm gonna square it. I'm gonna add the last value in my list, 10 minus 7.25, and again, I'm squaring that. I'm gonna take this entire value and I'm going to divide this by the number of commas or the number of gaps. So I have one, two, three spaces in between. I have four minus one or three on that denominator. So my variance, I'm gonna type this into my calculator. That's gonna give me my S squared. And I don't have a shortcut for this. I'm just kind of going through it each time. If I have a really, really large data set, I tend to use technology to find the variance in the standard deviation. That is a skill that I will show you throughout the term. For now though, we're doing it by hand, so that way we can have an intuitive understanding of what these numbers mean when we get them. So when I did this, I got 4.25 for my variance. If I wanted the standard deviation, that's going to be the square root of the number that I get from this long process. So my average gap size for this set is approximately 2.06 or so. Let's look at another one. Which set has a larger standard deviation, 0088 or 02468? Now, I'm not even gonna calculate anything for this one. I'm just gonna show you the graph and kind of explain what's going on. So this first set has zero showing up twice and eight showing up twice. The second set, Zero, two, four, six, eight. The standard deviation is the average gap size from the center. So two consequences of this. The further the values are from the center, so the more spread,
the larger the standard deviation. So the further the values are away from the center, so the more spread out it is, the bigger that standard deviation is. My other observation that I just want to give you, if you happen to have a standard deviation of zero, this tells you that your values are all equal to the center and that there's no spread. So if they're close or clumped in the center, that's a small standard deviation. If they're showing up more on the outsides, that's a larger standard deviation. So where I have a lot of things on the fringes, this has a larger standard deviation. It has more spread from the middle. This has a smaller standard deviation. It has more values in the middle. You have the formula, so I would encourage you to actually calculate these things to make sure that this matches up. But it looks like this first set has the larger standard deviation. You should be able to see that from the numbers as well. We've now looked at how to calculate these things using uh, numbers. We've looked at how to describe these things with words for graphs. And we've also dealt with the vocabulary of unimodal, bimodal, left skewed, right skewed, symmetric, and outliers. What I would still like to be able to do is describe the rarity of events. So for example, if I had the number 12 on this first graph, would that be an outlier or not an outlier? Would that be usual or unusual? And just as there are two ways of describing spread, five number summary and standard deviation, I'll have two ways to look at rarity of value.